Victoria, I guess. Yeah, so this is, I apologize to everyone. This is the first in our progressive politics in the time of pandemic IPS free webinar summer series. Um, and since it's the, the, the first one, we have a few glitches. Um, I'm on, I'm on, um, oh, I'm, Marcy, on. I'm sorry. Like, she's on. Okay, there you go. Yes, Marcy. <laughs> I didn't see you before. All right. No, I just, sorry, my kids are uh, late, so I'm here. <laughs> yes, this is, this is, as we've all learned during this progressive politics in the time of pandemic, kids, cats, dogs, <laughs> dishes. Uh, tend to interrupt. Okay, so we are at 1130. Uh, and what, I, what I'd like to do is welcome everybody uh, here. And this, as I said, is the first in our series. Uh, it's being recorded, so you can also distribute it. We had a number of people register who are unable to attend at the time. Um, and we will uh, put this also on our website so it will be accessible. So if you have, for instance, colleagues uh, in the field of education or in juvenile justice or who care about kids and have access to lawmakers and so forth, you'll be able to share this webinar with them. And I wanted to start off um, initially though taking time to just to uh, before I introduce our stellar panel and start our webinar, I just wanted to take the time to, to, to notice and, and, and honor two incredible moments in our country right now. One is the awe-inspiring protests around the country that are reacting against centuries-long oppression against especially Black people, but also Brown, Indigenous, immigrant, LGBTQ people, people living at those intersections, people who are living in poverty, and that we seem to have come together, at least initially, uh, in, in unprecedented numbers to say, this is enough, and we're not going to stand for it anymore. Now, standing up with a sign is one thing, making structural change is another. We're going to talk today about some steps towards real structural change for children. Uh, and then I also wanted to just acknowledge a celebration that the movements that are on the street and that many of you are involved in have brought about two historic Supreme Court decisions this week that are just worth celebrating. And one happened on Monday um, that finally said that LGBTQ people are people and uh, have rights and cannot be discriminated against in the workforce, which will expand um, legal, legal rights in other realms. Now there's a lot more to fight besides legal rights, but it's a critical first step, huge, unexpected. And then today the Supreme Court stopped Donald Trump's attempt to end the DACA program, which is the program which keeps, um, which, which doesn't allow uh, children who are brought here undocumented as children who now are young adults to, and children does, that wouldn't have allowed them to stay in the country. So his efforts to have them deported and that program stopped have been halted by the Supreme Court. So those are both huge victories brought about by movements. That's how change happens. That's the only way change happens. The Supreme Court doesn't do it on its own. It only does it because we force them to. And that's what people are out in the streets forcing people to do now. And I have the great pleasure to have four people who are incredible researchers, writers, activists, advocates, who have been out in the street for decades working for this and other change. Um, and just before I introduce them, I'm going to introduce myself and uh, I'll introduce them. I will give a short statement on, on what we're doing at the Institute for Policy Studies, then I'll turn it over to them. Each of our panelists will speak for about five to seven minutes, and then uh, we'll have a discussion, a couple of discussion questions among the panel, and then open it up for discussion from all of you. Mm -hmm. So that shouldn't take too long before we get to the discussion. So I'm Karen Dolan, and I direct the Criminalization of Poverty Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. We're a multi-issue progressive think tank in Washington, D.C. We have been 
advocating for peace and justice since 1963. Um, I would like to direct you to our website, ips-dc.org, ips-dc.org. We have so many resources on everything from the racial wealth divide to climate justice, to just foreign policy, to anti-militarism, to anti-poverty, to restorative justice, to almost any kind of peace, justice, and um, climate uh, issue that you can think of. And uh, our panelists will also tell you the, the resources on their websites as well. And I just wanted to start um, by recognizing a couple of statistics that are in some of our work. You can look for a report called Students Under Siege that's being updated right now. My intern uh, Uma and my oh, intern Celia, who will be joining, are probably on that as well. On as well. Um, Karen, I can't. This is Dara. Before we get started, can everyone please mute yourselves? If you're not speaking, please mute yourselves. Yeah, I can see a number of people are unmuted. Right, and so we're getting feedback. So please mute yourselves. And if not, Karen, you can go in and mute. If you go in, in under participants, click your thing. We were just joined by a host. Let's see. Well, whoever the host is, they can mute everyone. But please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Okay, go ahead, Karen. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we have a hundred people on, so we really want to be, um, we really want everybody to mute themselves. I don't actually know how to do that. I see um, still some people who aren't, so just a reminder, please mute yourselves. What, what I focus on myself, and it's a very narrow issue, uh, and our panelists will broaden that out for you, but I just want to bring uh, attention to the fact that as you hear the calls for defunding the police out in the streets, we also want that to uh, carry over to defunding what they call SROs, school resource officers, which are none other than armed police officers in school that cause tremendous harm to children. Children are also at harm from the police outside of school. But inside of school, we have almost 2 million students are in schools with cops, but no counselors. So let that, that sink in. 2 million students in schools that have armed police, but they don't have any school counselors. 3 million students, um, Three million more students are in schools with cops, but no nurses. Six million students are in schools with cops, but no school psychologists. 10 million school students are in schools with cops and no social workers. Uh, there's approximately almost 50,000 uh, policemen patrolling America's schools. They, there's no evidence whatsoever that they keep, keep children safer. There's plenty of evidence that they harm children. And disproportionately arrested, targeted, profiled are black students. They're three times more likely. Just a reminder, if you could please um, mute. I know you'd like some of the meetings. <laughs> could you please mute? Um, we're, we're hearing people speaking. So if you could just, thanks. Uh, black students are three times more likely to attend school with more security staff than mental health personnel. Black and Latinx students make up 40% of the U.S. school population in 2017, while making up almost 60% of school arrests. And those statistics go on and on. And we'll talk about some, some uh, action steps to address that that you can do in your own school district. So we're going to start, and I'll introduce each speaker as it's their turn to speak. And we're starting with Marcy Mistret, who I have had the great pleasure of working with for several years. And Marcy has been the CEO of the Campaign for Youth Justice. And I invite her to give the uh, website either verbally or in the chat. Since 2014, Campaign for Youth Justice launches state and national campaigns that are anchored in the experiences of the youth and families most impacted by these harmful policies. 80% of states in DC have changed 100 plus laws, making it more difficult to treat children as adults. So these are some of the victories. Um, trained in social work, Marcy began her career working in community-based legal aid with court-involved court youth, focusing on youth transferred into the adult system. 
She was then director of training and evaluation for a national funding collaborative that identified community-based responses to violence prevention. Uh, Marcy has her BA from American University and her AM in social S service administration from the University of Chicago and her accolades go on and on, which we don't have time for all of them, but we are really anxious to hear, Marcy, what you have to say, so I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, and hi, everybody. I see so many familiar names, if not familiar faces, and I'm um, really happy to have such a great group of people join us today. Um, and I, I want to recognize that many of you have been in the field of youth justice reform walking with us over the past 15 years. So some of the things um, you might hear from me today, which is really just the broad brush of reform, um, many of you might know about, but I did want to, I think it's important as we hear, as Kara said earlier, these calls from the street. Um, many of us know the calls have been loud and persistent um, beyond uh, these past month, you know, past couple of months. And it's nice, um, it's hopeful, it's a hopeful moment that came at tremendous, tremendous cost of l human life and pain and suffering um, for us to finally be listening. So, um, so I'm gonna focus on, uh, you know, the campaign for youth justice focuses on the very, very deep end of youth justice reform. We, we focus on children who are excluded from the youth justice system, who are in the criminal justice system as a result of um, very, very punitive and draconian laws that were passed in the 1990s as a way to try to uh, curb youth violence that had taken um, a, a, a jump up in, in, in the numbers. And as a result, when we opened 15 years ago, about 250,000 children a year uh, were excluded from family court and were treated as if they were adults. Um, and you know, we refer to this as the adultification of youth. Um, it is, it is, it starts with policing. Um, you know, there is a very, very important study called the Essence of Innocence that actually interviewed both police officers and college students and found that both those groups end up adding about two years to the age of black children and take away two years of age to white children. So there is an inherent four year gap in how law enforcement and college students see children of color. And I think that gives permission to treat them like children or tr to stop treating them like children um, and, and to put them in the adult criminal justice system. So. I have worked really hard with many of you. Um, there's a lot of family members on this call. Jeanette will follow me. She and I are longtime allies in this fight um, to just say that is absolutely not okay. Um, so one thing I'm gonna start with is um, really just giving the context of where we are in terms of youth arrest and youth crime. Um, for 15 years, there has been a very deliberate um, investment by private philanthropy and reforms that have really been led by the state level to change the way that we look at young people in the youth justice system, right? In the 1990s, uh, even late 80s, there was about 2.2 million arrests a year of young people. I don't know how many people got to see OJJDP's report today, but I am happy to announce <laughs> that there has been a 73% a, a drop in the number of young people who have been arrested in the past, um, uh, since the 1990s, so that's almost 30 years. So that is something that is incredibly, uh, we can clap, we can snap, you know, your little things at the bottom, feel free to put the claps off, because I think that's something that all of us have really, really fought really hard to right-size the youth justice system. But I want to, so I want to say two things about that. One, we can decarcerate and youth crime can continue to fall, because while we are at a low of, uh, you know, a 50-year low of youth arrests, we have also reduced incarceration of young people by nearly 60%. So anyone that says, if you let them out, if you let kids out of secure custody or deep end confinement, you're gonna see numbers go up. 
I would say the youth justice system has absolutely pro proven that incorrect. And if anything, has shown that um, young people, when they are treated in their communities with appropriate supports, with their families, um, can really, really turn their lives around very quickly. Uh, I also want to say that young people in the adult criminal justice system have also dropped by 70%. And a big reason for that is that many, uh, 13 states have, aised, have raised the age of criminal responsibility um, and now consider children who are under the age of 18 in their youth justice system. Um, there is only Texas, Wisconsin, and Georgia that still considers every 17-year-old um, in their state as adults. Um, I also want to point out that the crime is going down no matter what the charge. Um, and this again goes to the work on the ground with wrapping arms, not just by, uh, not just with this narrative of nonviolent versus violent youth. There's been incredible, really strong research out there that our definition of violence has widened tremendously, which has given the authority of police to go into every fabric of children's lives, right? So Karen talked about SROs. We know it's not limited to school resource officers. Some schools also contract with their local police. Some schools also contract with private security. Some school districts do all three. Um, we know that children are policed in their housing, on public transportation. Um, they are policed in after school activities. Um, so the fact that despite all of that um, investment in really surveilling and monitoring young people, young people are really still only arrested, only about 6% of the arrests are for any crimes of violence. Um, and I want to say that the OJGD report, OJGDP report today talks about the most serious declines have been for robberies and aggravated assaults. And I want to point that out because that is also the two biggest drivers of children into the adult system. So if the numbers are going down, let's bring those kids back to the youth justice system. Um, one thing that I know Josh is going to talk to in depth, so I'm not going to talk about it in depth right now, is that um, young people of color have been disproportionately harmed and targeted by all of our uh, by all of our law enforcement and justice practices. Uh, they have also, while they have benefits, certainly there's much fewer children in the system, um, they have benefit far less than uh, white children, despite the fact that we know that children um, engage in criminal behavior at roughly the same rates um, across the board. Uh, <clears throat> as I said earlier, um, the reforms have happened largely in the states um, and many, and they have, the narrative has been shifted because of the leadership of young people and their families. Um, Jeanette will be talking a lot about how that work has transpired, um, but I will tell you at the Campaign for Youth Justice, the narrative changes when young people talk about their own experiences. Um, I see Preston on here from our allies at the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth. Um, and I think that their ICANN membership has really, really helped to, sh help to shift and help stakeholders understand that even children that um, engage in violence are not irredeemable and really that love will get you a lot farther than punishment. So I wanna, I'm not gonna, um, talk a lot about what Jeanette can do because I'll let her voice do the talking there, but we could not have gotten this far without the parents and the children who have been willing to share their experience, um, experiences with legislators and system stakeholders along the way. Um, at the, yep, am I no, up? No. Am I up? Okay, no, no. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna real quickly just say that um, Dara's going to talk about the federal level uh, broader reforms, but I do want to talk about two cornerstone pieces of legislation that have really helped to change this uh, kind of built on the work of the states to make sure that it becomes standard practice and um, that there are incentives for states to follow good practice. Uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act that calls for um, the, you know, that incentivizes um, through their youthful inmate 
standard that young people need to be treated and protected if they are in the adult system um, by having separate housing, by being escorted, by being sight and sound separated um, from adults. And that is really, really important because it's been a tool that has made states look at their criminal justice system and decide that it's better that those young people get returned to youth um, to youth custody. And that has been a real big win. Um, I know that Massachusetts uh, really use that as a lever and Texas has been using it as a lever um, to get kids out of the adult criminal justice system. And then in 2018, the, of course, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act uh, that not only expanded the definition of disproportionate minority contact to racial and ethnic disparities and require states to not only track that data but respond to it with decisive action, any of the disparities, it also required um, that by the end of next year, every child under that state's age of criminal responsibility be removed from adult facilities. So it is a really important law. Um, and it also narrowed the ability of states to um, lock up young people uh, for their own well-being um, and, and really narrow the use of the uh, valid court order exception. So that is really, really important. Um, and, and then the last thing I'll say is that FIPSA or the Family First Prevention Services Act also is mirroring these interests by calling for a very significant reduction in group congregate care for children in the, in the child welfare system. And we know all too much, all too often, our kids in the, um, our adolescents in the child welfare system end up in the juvenile justice system. So I will just wrap my points by saying young people in this country need to be celebrated um, and nurtured and that will bring us into a healthy adulthood. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy. I really appreciate that. I am um, sorry, I'm double tasking here trying to figure out the muting. Um, I'm going to mute all for a moment and my speakers, I believe, know how to unmute yourself. We're going to go to Jeanette next, but first I'm going to mute everyone. Okay, so Jeanette and Josh uh, and Dara, you know how to unmute yourself by just clicking onto the microphone uh, because we had some people who were unmuted on the, on the call. Thank you so much, Marcy, and we'll talk more about that in the discussion uh, period. And now I'm going, I have the great pleasure to introduce Jeanette Bocanegra, whom I met several years ago when we were working on a report called Mothers at the Gate how uh, family, families' movement of families of incarcerated children were transforming the juvenile legal system. And it's so important to center families and children, as Marcy said, in the work for their own liberation and to dismantle this unjust uh, juvenile legal system. And Jeanette has a very long bio, which I won't go into all of it, but I will just read a little bit. Jeanette, Bocanegra recently transitioned as the executive director with Justice for Families. It, so she's currently the director of Justice for Families. In 2010, Jeanette joined Community Connections for Youth as the lead New York City researcher for Justice for Families uh, in producing their report, Families Unlocking futures. You can also find the report that features Jeanette and her son, Joe Power, who was caught up in the system on our website um, and at the report called Mothers at the Gate. Since, uh, let me go down here. She's got so much. Um, I, I'll try to post this in the, in the chat. Jeanette took the role uh, of advocating for families with youth in the juvenile justice system based on her own difficult experiences as the parent of an incarcerated youth. She thrives to ensure that young people who have come into contact with the juvenile justice system are given a second chance to become productive members of their communities and to provide families with the tools and resources to help their children succeed. And I'm so honored to have you, Jeanette, and we all look forward to hearing from you. I'm honored and, and I'm also, I call myself the fortunate parent that I was able to connect myself with amazing folks as yourself, Karen and Marcy and, and Annie, who's also on, on, in Florida. 
Um, my experience was horrible. I think, you know, when, when I hear your son that's incarcerated, a mother with an incarcerated son, you know, I, I also think about why, what happened to my other five kids that never went through the system? Um, so prior to doing juvenile justice work, thank you for the introduction. Um, prior to doing juvenile justice work, I worked with a nonprofit, an amazing nonprofit organization in New York with families and young people in the public school system. So I knew how to navigate the school system. I understood the language of the school system. I did not understand the school to prison pipeline. Um, and just helping parents understand and making sure that any child with an IEP who had a disability, thank you, Dara, I'm gonna use appropriate words, um, who had a disability, received the services and support that they needed. I understood that there were no fundings to educate our kids. Everything was always very small pockets of funding. But I also noticed that there were more school offices um, being requested to work in the public school system in New York City. And we have a huge, huge uh, educational system. Many of our schools have over 3,000 kids in a building. So in 2010, my youngest made a, a, a mistake in school and it, it caused the school calling the cops. I, I, got, in, I got, it, got introduced through this and not understanding the language not understanding the type of funding that goes into incarcerating young people. So I got involved with Justice for Families. And when I hear about data, which is, I love data now, but I used to hate data. I used to hate data because I live in those communities where it's a revolving door for system involvement, where there's juvenile justice system, low performing schools, the child welfare system, um, the mental health system, systems that have all been oppressing our communities. And these are systems that we've been talking about that have not been serving communities. And we've talked about the racial disparities and the over-policing in our schools. And to the point where generations of families and young people have fallen into these cracks of failing toxic systems. And when I was able to understand data, the story that's being told about our families, because I also worked on a research project, which I needed to provide sur um, surveys and, 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 and hear the voices of families through focus groups, I understood that data was so critical in telling our stories to make system reform and system change. You know, just talking about it with no data and concrete numbers made it difficult for decision makers and even for us as community members to hold local politicians accountable for the platforms that they believe in that, are, that they might not think are hurting our communities. I think that even at this moment, even though COVID-19 has turned this world upside down, it put us on a, on a stop, we all had to stop. We noticed that there were things that we thought couldn't change changed, especially with the juvenile justice system, um, releasing kids that were not danger to society because these are kids. We also have to learn about the brain development, adolescent behavior, um, things that young people do that are normal. What are the things that they need? In our com I, I'm going to also, you know, I'm going to be jumping all over because I took some notes. Let's celebrate young people right now. Because of them, there's being, we're looking at real system reform with police. And not only in the communities that we live in, but get them out of our schools. And I'm getting chills as I'm saying this because the language that we use in juvenile justice can be applied to advocate for kids in schools. We want those officers out of the schools and we want more guidance counselor, more social workers, more restorative justice circles and, and understanding that if I made a mistake, how can I make it better for, to those who I, I hurt? 
So I think that when, when, when we think about young people and families, it is really now a relief in my community. I'm going to say that COVID gave me now the opportunity to be able to speak about the things that are not fair, because sometimes you think uh, it's happening in my community and I have to be numb to it. It's normal. That I have now my white allies that were home watching the news, stuck on social media. I didn't think I would love social media so much and technology. Like I, I had to learn so much. When, I, when I'm with a professional and they mis make mistakes on the webinar, I'm like, okay, Janet, you're not that bad. So we have to adapt to this new technology norm, but I don't want us to go back to the same norm. I don't want us to continue this technology norm because I think about those who are still incarcerated. Would they restrict personal human contact visits because this technology world is working? Uh, as community members, we need to get involved. I'm going to uh, just also jump about some of the things we did here in New York. Marcy, thank you for leading campaigns as Raise the Age in New York. We raised the age of criminal responsibility. When I spoke years ago in front of city council about my young child at 16 in Rikers, the things that were happening to these kids in that facility, if as a parent I did those things, I would have been arrested. If I would have, for whatever reason, locked my son in a room for 23 hours, for eight months during the course of one year, I would be held responsible for that type of abuse. If I didn't send my son to school at 16, the child welfare system would have been knocking on my door. So there were so many things that were going on with these young, amazing, talented young people. And then we wonder why they come back to the community so traumatized. So as community members, we've also been impacted by trauma but we don't talk about it because it's been compressed. We think it's okay. It's, no one is gonna do anything. Nothing is gonna change. But I'm gonna tell you that things do change. As, as if, we, if we get the tools and we align ourselves with the right folks, Gladys Carrion, who was the commissioner of the child welfare system here in New York and New York State and New York City, she closed 21 upstate juvenile facilities and five in New York City. So things can happen. New York changed the law of criminal responsibility. 16 year olds are no longer in the adult system. But there's still so much that needs to be done. I love the fact that we're talking about schools. When I learned that in New York, we were wasting almost $300,000 to incarcerate a kid for one year versus less than 20,000 to educate a kid in a public school. I knew that I had to put all my efforts and my energy and my passion because sometimes, you know, I can become very passionate about the way I, I feel and the way things are happening. And I, use, I like the word passion, but I can be an angry Latina woman. <laughs> But because if our kids are not okay, we can't be okay. And the fact that our young people are persistent right now about the abuse, I'm like, I'm glad they, the young ones are the one with the energy because I'm setting up a space here in New York in the Bronx with a community center of healing and advocacy where we can provide young people and their families the tools that they need to strengthen their family. And COVID, for some families, it became hard because now you have to quarantine yourself together in a small place. It's hard because everyone is so social and want to be out. But the COVID also put families together 
And there's programs out there that are creating cooking programs, virtual cooking programs. And I've known young people and their families now are cooking together. It took time because first it's like you're in my space, you're breathing my air and move away. There's no such thing as social distancing in, in a New York City apartment. But we had to learn to take care of each other, love each other. And because of the COVID, there was so much uncertainties and still, but it brought awareness to the injustice that is happening across the world. But we're focusing in the United States and I'm glad that other countries are standing in solidarity with us because it's not fair what our young people, particularly people of color. So I wanna thank all my white allies, honestly, for standing with us and fighting with us. It makes a huge difference. Jeanette, thank you so much. You're always on I feel fire. Like I'm rambling. And Sometimes I'm rambling. No, you're not rambling. You're, you're, you're revving us up to action, which is where, where we need to be. So thank you so much. And I'm going to remind people if you would go to the top right hand side, uh, top right hand corner of your Zoom screen and press speaker view, then you'll be able to see those who are talking and it's a little less distracting than seeing all the little Hollywood squares. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. And our next speaker is Joshua Robner. And Josh is a senior advocate, uh, advocacy associate with the Sentencing Project here in DC, where he works on a portfolio of issues, including juveniles sentenced to life without parole, the transfer of juveniles into the adult criminal system, and racial and ethnic disparities in juvenile justice. And I also asked Josh if he would uh, join us today because he's been the one person in the country keeping track of where COVID is affecting children and guards in who are uh, children who are incarcerated and the devastation that, that that brings with it and all that COVID does in terms of what Jeanette told us of also about denying kids face-to-face -face contact with their families. Kids are being isolated um, in basically solitary confinement because there's not another way to, conf to confine uh, infected children uh, in congregate settings. But I'm gonna turn it over to Josh to explain that to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Karen. And you know, I have to thank Jeanette, um, you know, following her is a difficult place to be in, in any panel, but she also said something as we were preparing for this and said again today about how for a long time she hated data until she saw how it could be used. And, and I understand that no one really wants to be reduced to a number. I'm sure that it has a lot to do with the perspective that I bring uh, as someone who grew up in a comfortable suburban setting of never feeling that way. And perhaps also being a sports fan, that numbers speak to me in a certain way, that Will Chamberlain scoring 100 points in a game or Babe Ruth hitting 60 home runs in a season means something to me, that speaks to me in a way that, that stories speak to other people, that numbers have meaning to me. Um, you know, I'm so thankful that there's such a big audience today taking a big interest in this um, with so much going on in the world. Uh, I've been doing this youth justice work since 2014. And I really generally find myself as a voice of hope through what I see in the data. Uh, there's so much work to do, but we've accomplished so much already. Marcy spoke to this a lot. You know, at the start of this century, we had 120,000 young people locked up on a typical day in America. A tenth of them were in prisons and jails built for adults. And as of 2018, that number has fallen by two thirds. That didn't happen on its own. It happened because of an impressive array of families, of youth, researchers, advocates. They forced elected leaders to listen and to change. Groups like Justice for Families and the Campaign for Youth Justice made that happen. And so while we're still fighting every day for the 40,000 kids who are still locked up and for the many more who will cycle through, let's not forget how far we've come. A part of the reason that we fight is because of the persistence of racial and ethnic disparities in our youth justice system. At the start of the century, African-American youth were four times as likely to be incarcerated 
as their white peers were. And as overall incarceration has fallen, that disparity has actually grown. So where it used to be about four times as likely for an African-American kid to be locked up, it's now four and a half times as likely. The disparity has grown even larger. Now, since March, I've been counting the incidents of COVID-19 in juvenile facilities, the number of incarcerated youth and the staff who work in those facilities who've tested positive. Like most of you, I was overwhelmed by the news, but I also knew that this virus was going to spread because that's what viruses do unless something gets in its way. Uh, and so the obvious solution to limiting that spread was to, um, to let the kids go home. Big portions of kids in detention centers and elsewhere are there on drug possession or status offenses, public order offenses like resisting arrest or theft. And even more of them are low risk regardless of the charges that led them there. Um, so I had a, a slide that I was going to present. Justin, are you able to load that up? And I'll keep talking either way. Um, I started counting this every day to see um, just how many kids and staff were testing positive uh, for these cases. And at last count, it's more than 600 incarcerated youth who've tested positive. It started with one youth in a facility in uh, Missouri, the Hogan Street Regional Youth Center in St. Louis. On March 13th, I learned of the first kid who tested positive. And week by week through mid-May, we saw more youth getting infected, and most likely due to staff members bringing the virus into the facilities in the first place. So we had some big weeks along the way. Uh, in the week of April 12th, there were 48 cases up from where there were just a handful. 48 cases on one, on one week, 25 of them were in one facility in Virginia. And we only know about them because the families of the youth held at the Bon Air Juvenile Correctional Center, working with Rise for Youth and the Legal Aid Justice Center, insisted that something was wrong, even while the official word was that everything was fine. The press release was issued at 6 p.m. on a Friday evening. Everything was not fine. The next week, we learned about 22 cases at the Memphis Center for Independence, revealed again over a weekend to keep it quiet. In May, we learned that 84 girls at the Mingus Mountain Academy in Arizona had tested positive. And we also know that officials tried to keep that quiet, but public defenders wouldn't let them. Today, I learned that it wasn't 84 girls, it was actually 92. Those numbers keep growing. These cases didn't always come out in bursts. So there are 26 kids at the Pendleton Juvenile Correctional Center in Indiana. That was revealed over the course of three weeks. A few a day, there was one day that there were eight new cases that were revealed. So while it often feels in the news, because our attention is understandably elsewhere, that things have calmed down, I think it's so important to understand that things have not calmed down. First, the data that I have is incredibly incomplete. States and localities are not reporting everything they know. I require quite, uh, excuse me, I rely quite a bit on local media for county detention centers. And media attention, as I said, is elsewhere right now. Some private facilities have said they're keeping their COVID-19 data secret. My counts rely heavily toward the largest public facilities, which makes some sense intuitively. The virus is more likely to spread in larger places, but I also don't have great data on where testing has revealed negative results. As close as I've been tracking, my data are shards of information, but not a complete picture. Moreover, just like outside the walls, we're not testing enough to know the true scope of the problem. So if we take a look at the last three weeks, we had 36 cases three weeks ago, 41 cases two weeks ago, 67 cases last week. Again, that's a growth over the last three weeks, 36, 41, 67. The 67 cases that were announced last week included 32 at three Missouri facilities. One of those facilities was the Hogan Street facility that I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, where the first case was revealed three months ago. We haven't tamed this virus, and we can still release far more kids and give them the support they need to thrive at home instead of in these awful places. Uh, so I will hand it over to, I suppose, back to Karen now, who will introduce Dara. Uh, I'm very happy to share information that I've collected for those of you working locally, uh, you can reach me pretty easily at jrovner at sentencingproject.com, excuse me, dot org. Um, and we're also online, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at Josh Rovner. Um, but thank you so much for all of your interest today. 
Thank you, Josh. And I put your slide uh, in the chat. Thank you. Because I don't quite know how to share it, but okay. people can copy it from the chat or they can open it in a new in a new window and it will be open for you. And so um, last but definitely not least, oh, there we go, there's the slide. But we can we can we can leave that slide now, Justin, because we're going on anyway, to I and I will I will hide that now. I'll stop sharing my screen. But those are the that's the growth and what we've seen especially over the last three weeks is disconcerting. So thanks. Oh, I see you did that. Okay. I should have asked you to do that before. Thank that's you, okay. Josh. We're, we're moving to Dara is our last speaker. Dara has also, as with all of the panelists, a very long bio and very many accolades and accomplishments. And I'm gonna just try to cut them down just a little bit in the interest of time. But uh, Dara Baldwin is the, is the Director of National Policy for the Center for Disability Rights Incorporated. The CDR is a not-for-profit community-based advocacy and service organization for people with all types of disabilities. She is the national and international disability rights activist and policy maker. Um, in her position, Ms. Baldwin is responsible for the legislative work from research and writing comments, testimonies, letters, and reports to assisting with advocacy outreach, working with congressional staff, the administration, coalition partners, and others on multiple issue areas of improving the lives of persons with disabilities. She has extensive knowledge of the American with Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, the Access Carrier Act of 1986, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and other disability laws. And uh, Dara knows just about everything there is to know about Capitol Hill and the state of play with legislation that affects many of the uh, issues that we're talking about today. And take it away, Dara. Thank you. Um, peace and blessings, everyone out there. Please be safe and keep not only your mind, your body safe, but your mind. And power to the people. Power to the people. I mean, in this day and age, it is that that is the. I always start off with power to the people. Um, so I just want to say thank you to IPS and to Karen for having me here, and all my fellow panelists who are excellent, and everyone out there. I see names that I know. I'm so glad that you all are um, out there doing the work. I want to say it to you. If no one else has said this to you thank you thank you and thank you again also i can't i would be remiss i am um, living and working in washington dc so i must say this and i always say it before i speak dc statehood dc statehood dc statehood if you did not see why when that man in that white house put military in our streets because we have no control we do not have a governor who can say do not do this so DC statehood, it is going to the floor in a couple of days. Uh, so we are glad to see that happening. Um, and that is important and imperative in this work. So you understand and know how our juvenile system runs and works in DC, which Marcy and him can talk about later. We have discussion. And then finally, I saw some Rutgers people on there. So go are you. I am a Rutgers graduate. So I must say that both undergrad and my graduate degree. So I must say that. So let me get started. Karen asked me to do a little bit about legislative updates I'm gonna start first about disabilities and disabled youth in the system. And um, love you, my sister Jeanette, she kind of got this. Uh, people use the term special needs, people with um, differing abilities. And I, we had our conversation, I explained, there's nothing wrong with disabilities and we want you to use the word. And if you are gonna work to protect disabled youth, then you must use the word because there's no law written that helps and protects special needs or differing in abilities or any of these. It is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Disabilities is the word. Um, and we all know all the statistics that Marcy gave <clears throat> and probably and Josh gave, we usually tell people to double them for like if you're saying youth of color, well, double it for disabled, um, triple it for disabled youth of color, right? Who are uh, black and brown disabled, and then triple it for our indigenous disabled. 
those numbers usually are triple. That is our problem in the system. We don't really have great data because the BOP and the OJJPP systems use multiple definitions for disabilities, which it amazes me. And we're just like, why do you not just use the disability that, that is defined in the ADA of 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and then it was increased and made better by the ADAA, which is the Amendment Act of 2008. And those you researchers out there, those should be your indicators. That is what the definition of a disability is. And then therefore our people can get what they need in their services from birth to death. And that doesn't happen, especially in juvenile justice, especially in the, in, in the prison system. And so we have issues and problems around that. Um, also, um, a lot of people do not use the ADA or the Rehab Act, which is the Rehabilitation Act of 1976, which um, you'll hear people, you know, many of you know, 504, 504, 5, everybody says that it's Section 504 of the Rehab Act, right? Like this is connected to something. And the Rehab Act was the affirmative um, action was being done through people of color, black people after the civil rights, and they went to disabled folks and said, if you want to have a civil right, use the Rehab Act, right? And so that was the first time a civil right was attached to a disability. And that means every institution in the country receiving federal funds must give a disabled person their civil right. So that means, right, and all the stuff we're talking about here, our youth in the system and what's happening to them both in school, right, outside of school, if you're receiving federal funds, you must provide a civil right for them. The McDonald's on the corner, who's privately owned, did not have to do that because they are not receiving federal funds. That didn't come until the ADA. That was what the ADA did, right? And so people know, the premise of the ADA is community integration. Exactly what we were talking about here from Marcy, Jeanette, and Josh. Our youth need to be in their community receiving love and care. And that is what the ADA says. We do not want them inside any type of institution, whether it be a prison, a mental health, a nursing home. Institutions are not where people with disabilities need to be or should be. And because of Title II of the ADA, and because of the Lois Curtis v. Olmstead Supreme Court case, and I say it that way because the disability community erases the black woman who that case was done for. Lois Curtis, LC, is a black woman still alive in Atlanta, Georgia, who fought and went to the Supreme Court and said, you cannot institutionalize me because I have a civil right to get out. That is what the Lois Curtis v. Olmstead case is. It is celebrating its 25th anniversary on Monday, the 22nd. And my organization's having a webinar. I'll put it in the link. But that is what that case says. And that case covers every institution in the country. And it covers every disabled person from birth to death. So I just want to put that out there so people understand and know how we use our laws to help youth who are in the system and who get out of the system because they deserve those services. We specifically work on not getting them in the system, right? Saying don't get them there, don't put them in there. So one area we talked about were SROs, school resource offices. We know that at a higher rate, black and brown children, black and brown disabled children are abused, beat up, and some have been killed by school resource offices. The fight that is happening in the streets right now, Black Lives Matter, it covers this. Stop killing our children. Law enforcement is not belong, does not belong in schools. So we say that, but I also wanna bring up transit police and housing authority. Let's not forget all of the law enforcement because if you're, you have been watching the news, you saw what happened in New York City in the subway system a couple of months ago around a group of youth having fun rapping, enjoying themselves, whatever they were doing, they weren't doing anything criminal. And yet 16 to 20 uh, law enforcement came through. Those were transit cops that started with, then it went to New York P PD. For what? They beat those kids up, they pulled out their guns, it's not necessary. So transit police, housing authority police, we have many anecdotal, there's no indicators, there's no research in housing about housing authority police and how they handle people. And so all of the institutions of law enforcement touch our children, and we need to keep that in the focus when we fight these fights. Um, on the, the legislative federal level, I'm just going to talk about three laws that are really moving that will be of interest to you all. 
well, not moving, but being worked on. Let me say that. So the Heroes Act passed in the House, which was the CARES um, stimulus package number four, um, which we all know, everyone thinks it's over, but it's not. The COVID is still going along. Thank you, Josh, for those numbers. So people understand this. This pandemic is still among us. And so people are still in need of stimulus package and funding. Um, we are fighting to get unemployment insurance extended. That ends at the end of this month. We're trying to fight that. Um, and there's a lot of funding in HEROES. We got a lot of good language around getting people out of the systems. The Congressional Black Caucus, I will tell you, has been excellent on this and saying, get these people out of all of the systems and specifically youth, right? We're like, get them out. They don't belong there. Um, it is unfortunate the Senate has not picked this up, will not pick this up, but has made it very clear. Mitch McConnell has made it very clear None of that language we put in there will be in anything that he writes. So we have a fight on our hands here. The second um, area I want you to pay attention to is that appropriations for fiscal year 21 is moving. I know in all of this that's going on, you know, from policing reform to um, Supreme Court cases coming out today. Yes, thank you for DACA. Thank you for LGBTQ. But at the same time, we have to have a budget and finances together for all of you wonderful people out there who are doing direct services. You need your money and we need to make sure you have it. So appropriations is moving forward on both the House and the Senate side. It is unfortunate. Mr. Shelby just yesterday put things on hold and is keeping things hostage around the policing reform. And I'll get to that next. But the House um, version of the appropriations for FY21 is moving forward. Your area and what you do falls under criminal justice appropriations. But please do not ignore um, labor HHS which is Labor Health and Human Services. Sorry, we speak in acronyms here in DC. Um, because that's where a lot of your services that you guys um, give and do fall under labor HHS. So you want to make sure that they're getting funded. Anything you do around Medicaid, anything you do around Medicare, anything you do around speech therapy, occupational therapy, all of that falls in labor HHS. So you want to see where those fundings are going. And I will put my um, information in. You can ask me. I, I do approach uh, for labor HHS criminal justice, and then T-HUD, which is Transportation, Housing, Urban, and Development. So if you do housing, let me know as well, because we want to make sure those funds are going there as well. Um, it is unfortunate that HUD received over $80 million for the CARES. They still have not released it. So people are homeless and stuff, or becoming homeless, because they haven't done that yet. And then finally, um, we have the Justice Policing Act, HR 7120, Karen Bass, chairwoman of the um, CBC, and um, Jerry Nadler, those of you from, I'm sorry, Karen Bass is the Democrat from California. Jerry Nadler, Democrat from New York, is the chair of the, of the Judiciary Committee. They put in their bill for policing act. <sighs> Unfortunately, it is a very watered down bill, and it is, it is a crying shame that we have these young people, all these people out here, and again, I thank you, and I say what, what Jeanette said, I thank my white allies. There are people out here putting their lives on the line for COVID-19 and protesting Black Lives Matter, and they are being beaten up by police and tear gas police. And yet and still, the Democrats who are in charge of the, of the House do not have the courage to create a bill that they are out there fighting for. What I say to you people, I say to everybody, anybody on here know me, I don't care. I have said it to these Congress people. I said it to Karen Bastav herself. This is outrageous and it is appalling that you all think that this is some kind of bill we would all go for. Many civil rights, human rights groups, specifically Black Lives Matter, Movement for Black Lives, Color Change, and um, uh, BYP 100 have stepped away and said, this is not what we wanted. And you will not see them supporting this bill. You may see some larger organizations doing it. That's where politics come in. I'm blessed to work for organizations. We don't have politics. My group is ADAPT. We took over Mitch McConnell's office over the ACA. So you understand where I come in. We will sit in somebody's office and take you over until you do what we want you to do. And it is unfortunate that this House bill is a piece of crap. You can read it. We have some side-by-sides. You can see it. I mean, they didn't want to touch QI. Uh, they didn't want to touch militarization of police. 
they did not remove SROs from schools. Give me a break here. Like they did not do those things in this HR um, 7120. The markup was yesterday. It has gone through the committee. It is going to the floor. Yes, there is still time to change this, but will Nancy Pelosi have the courage and the political back backing to do it? I honestly don't think so. So that is what's happening on the federal level. Um, so you know, people say, why do this? It is a marker bill. We are coming to the end of a, of a Congress. It is very, we are hopeful that we will have a different Congress next year. And that that is what you do. You put things in writing and you put it and get it on record. But we can't, I can't, I'm telling you now, my organization is not supporting this. I will not be on record so that 10 years from now or 10 months from now, someone pulls us up and says, well, you guys supported this. Why can't we pass that? That is not what I'm, we do. That is how they use it here. So um, if you have any questions about this bill, let me know. And then, of course, the Senate bill, <laughs> I mean, what Tim Scott released yesterday was a, another, that's even worse. Um, and we can talk about that. I can see you side by side and um, analysis that have been done around the policing bill over on the Senate side as well. So I'm going to turn it back over to Karen because I know we have some time for discussion. Again, thank you for your work. Um, it is needed. I, I am an activist at heart, as you saw, power to the people first. And I do my policy from the streets, what is happening, to the suites and back again. The suites are not important. It is the streets who run the suites. So, and we're going to talk about action later. And I'm going to tell you about what I think about our next steps in action. Will be. Thank you, Dara. That was, uh, Dara always lights things on fire and tells it the way it is. And Dara, would you mind putting your contact information in the chat? for people who don't have it. Because I think a lot of people are really gonna be interested in those side-by-sides that you talked about and you know, just getting a little bit more information from you. Um, and I, we, we're gonna open it up for chat, but what I wanted to just do really quickly, and if every um, panelist could just say it as briefly as possible, I would just like one action step from each of you, even if you said it in your presentation, so that people that are watching today from wherever they're coming from, one thing that you would recommend that they do. There's a lot more than one thing. So I know it's hard to pick one thing. You can put more in the chat, but just in the interest of time, so we have time to go to the audience. If, if we could just go in the order that we spoke and just um, give one action item. So we'll start with Marcy. Sorry, hard for me to pick one, especially with DC statehood, but I did put in the um, chat that the HEROES Act does have JJ provisions in it, and we are asking for those provisions to be passed, and there is a link to, to a way you can take action, so. Thank you, Marcy. And what I'm gonna share is, well, actually two, which are our two main goals at Justice for Families, to transform the juvenile justice system so that it is driven by the interests of families and young people and move those resources back into the communities that are mostly impacted. And, you know, we talk about justice system, but it's all these systems um, that we need to make sure that our kids are doing okay. Thank you, Jeanette. Josh. Yeah, so I have a pretty narrow uh, ask for everyone. Um, you know, it's the the Department of Juvenile Justice in your state may have a weird name for it. So just enter the name of your state into Google and Department of Juvenile Justice and something will come up like, you know, Department of uh, Rehabilitation Services or Office of Youth Affairs or something like that. And you'll find a phone number on that for contact. And I want you to call up that phone number and ask them how many kids in the state facilities have tested positive and how many staff in the state facilities have tested positive and ask them where they're posting that information so that the public can find out. Uh, and when you find out that information, send me an email, jrovner at sentencingproject.org. If you're willing to go farther, do the same with your county. Enter the name of your county and juvenile justice into Google. You'll probably find a Department of Youth Affairs in there. Again, make a phone call and ask them, how many kids in the youth detention center in the county have tested positive and how many staff have tested positive and where can the public find that information? Excellent, thank you, Josh. And Dara. Hi everyone, sure, yeah, so I have two as well. One, they kind of piggyback off each other. One is make sure you are registered to vote and you get out there and vote. 
and vote safely because we need you to vote. Um, it is very imperative that voting happens in 2020. Um, get on board with how that happens, whether it's voting by mail, which so you know, as a disabled activist, we don't encourage every state to go fully by mail because not every disabled person can vote that way. And then, and then HAVA, the Help America Vote Act, it says vote in the format that's best for you. But please go out there and vote. Um, you have state level um, elections that are important, governors, um, as well as mayors and stuff. And you have the house, you know, the whole house is up for election. And so you have Senate races. And the second one is, in fact, in fact, what I was talking about, um, people find this and say it's lobbying. It is not lobbying. It is, it is uh, um, educating your Congress people. You need to know who your Congress person is in your district and your Senator. And I say that people go, oh, well, no, they don't. And every person you touch and every family you touch and you say that we have to change this, they should know who their representative is. They should know the name, the phone number of their chief of staff so they can contact and call them. You as a citizen, you as a person in this country can call any House member in Congress, any senator in Congress, and tell them how you feel. And at this time, when these people, if you can't go out there and, and protest and march and you feel like you're not doing anything, guess what you can do? Pick up your phone, tweet your members, and say, you better be following what these people are asking for. Tweet them every single day. Call them every single day and say, you need to do what we want you to do. You can use your power to help and move change in different ways, and one of them is this. Congressional members need to hear from you. Thank you so much, Dara. Um, I'm gonna invite people to put questions in the chat. I think Justin was collecting questions, but I don't know, Justin, are you on? If you, if you have, um, if you are, maybe send me those questions. Otherwise, I'll look in the chat. And just from me, I would like you to, find out in your school district do you in your child's school or in your school district are there armed police officers in your schools if so lobby to get them out uh, we have all the research that you need to show that there there's no evidence whatsoever that they make schools safer and there's plenty evidence that they harm children and they create a dangerous and militarized environment that you don't want your children in and um and that that money should be taken out of the budget line item for cops and put into restorative practices, restorative justice training, social workers, therapists, things that actually create health and safety in, in homes. So uh, Justin, are you still on? Do you have the questions for me? I texted him as well. He might not still be on. Um, So I, I'm not seeing the questions in the chat box because I've got these hey, participants. Yes. Hey, Karen, one thing people are asking is, is there going to be a follow up? There's a lot of resources in the chat. And is there going to be a follow up um, to all of the attendees about the resources listed in the chat and, and, and this webinar overall for people to share with colleagues? And yes. this is that you can save the chat room and I, I'll also copy the whole thing for you. So you can have the chat what's there and then you can use that to send out, but you can save the chat and just stay on at the end and I'll show you how to do it. Okay. Yeah. Dara's going to walk, walk that through me, uh, walk me through that. Unfortunately, I have, um, half my chat is covered with the participants when I was trying to mute everybody. So I don't see all of the chat. So if one of the other participants can help me read the questions on the chat. Sure. This is that. There's a In question addition, Todd. Can I ask you? And Todd, I think it's from Rutgers University. Is there a blueprint for how to raise this awareness locally and change the system from the inside out? We've done a good deal of advocacy. That's his question. I think Marcy kind of answered that. I think she was right with um, uh, what it, you put discipline. What's the school discipline? Yeah, so there's dignity. Um, I, I shared three links. Um, the the Dignity in Schools movement, which has a lot of lessons learned, and there are years and years of parent-led advocacy to get cops out of schools. Uh, and I want everyone to pay attention to the pitfalls that they faced. Um, a Youth First Initiative is also very active in New Jersey. They have the 150 Years is Enough campaign, but their young people in New Jersey are launching a campaign tomorrow on Juneteenth um, to talk about investing in them. 
So that would be another um, resource I would I would point you to there because our young people should. Yes. Excuse me. And for those of us who are are only able to access this important conversation today by phone, um, we would like an opportunity to be able to get back online and uh, on the computer and have access to all of the links. And so I'm um, just wanting to put that bug in your ear as well. Thank you. Yes, if you registered with an email address, then we can email you uh, the links in the chat and the recording. And if you- and, Perfect, uh, thank you very much. And and people that uh, want to speak that are on the phone and can't use the chat, if you want to ask a question, um, and please, please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Uh, and this is Zara. I just want to go back to what Marcy we uh, relayed out to Todd's question around the blueprint. And you know, we have worked with many of those groups uh, well, and uh, we love dignity in schools. But I just want to let you know, many of those groups have left out disabled children and youth in their work uh, purposely, and we tried because they didn't feel that you know it was ours, and that's fine um, because we we have our own fight. Um, and you can um, go to the leadership conference on civil and human rights. We created principles around schools um, and how schools should uh, treat children. Um, and so I will, I will get that on the chat box. And then finally, unfortunately, in the disability community, we have what's called um, restraining and secluding children. Um, you cannot do that, right, in a hospital or a, a juvenile system, but you can do that in schools. Uh, so that's another campaign we have to stop. So even though you get the social workers in there and stuff, we still have teachers who tie up our children, who seclude our children. They actually have seclusion, seclusion boxes, uh, which, right, many of those children are labeled bad children they are horrible children and then wind up in the juvenile justice system because they are, they are reacting to the trauma of being restrained and secluded. And then finally, we have a school, and actually FDA just released this, who tortures children is the Judge Rothenberg Center in, in Massachusetts, where they use electric shock and they feel that they're going to shock the disability out of the um, child, the youth. So, you know, he um, lost, right? The FDA has told him to shut down in Massachusetts. So, what do you do? You move to another state. So, he is planning to move around the country and take his model around the country. So, you know. So, please look out for Judge Rothenberg and his torturing of youth. And let me jump in real quickly. Justice for Families provide a five-day leadership institute for family advocates that would like to strengthen their skills and their, I say, their toolbox to be able to bring system reform into their jurisdictions. And I posted our, my email and our website on the chat box. Thank you. Dara, do you see any other questions in the chat? I'm seeing a question from Alex at the Trevor Project asking about uh, data on disparities for LGBTQ uh, people, especially youth, and asking if I have numbers on rates of incarceration um, for LGBTQ youth or any initiatives to do so. Uh, the Sentencing Project has, when we're a really small organization, and so we're limited in our scope of what we can do, we've been focused on racial and ethnic disparities over the years. So I don't have a great handle on that. I think that we're seeing very good work being done. And I hope that some of my colleagues will remind me of the names of our partner organizations that have been looking more closely at LGBTQ youth. Uh, we do know that it is highly disproportionate, um, especially in the, the push out, you know, kids who are you know, who used to be called runaways that are really being pushed out of their own home and, and sent to detention centers um, under that status offense of sleeping on the, the beach or something. Um, so while the sentencing project doesn't have a great handle on it, I do know that good work is being done on this and I'd just like to have one of my colleagues perhaps answer that question. And if not, um, I'll kind of multitask while we're talking and find the answer to that. I just can't oh. think off the top of my head. I'll say sorry because I was I was also multitasking, so I didn't hear the whole question. But our report, students under siege, about the school to prison pipeline, that's on the IPS website, ips-dc.org. We do look um, specifically, especially at trans students and criminalization of LGBTQ students and trans students in particular, and Black trans students in 
more particular. Um, and we have some data there. And a lot of that comes from the GLSEN reports and NCTE, the National Center for Transgender Equality, as you know, and the Williams Institute um, out of California. I think the Williams Institute might have the most updated data on the um, policing of LGBTQ youth. Uh, and this is Dara. You can also go to the National Trans uh, National LGBTQ Task Force. Um, they are working around this, as well as um, Black and Pink is another group that works around this. And I'll put those in the chat box. Um, but as Josh said, there's a whole group of um, LGBTQ organizations who have their own criminal justice uh, and juvenile justice working group that they work on this. And a couple of them have reports. Karen, what I will do is get that information and get it back to you so that you can have it as part of this series. But many of the LGBTQ groups uh, work on this. Uh, the National um, Center for Lesbian Rights does some of this work as well as um, uh, NJ MBJC, which is the National Black Justice Coalition, which is a African American or Black and Brown LGBTQ group, which is run by David John. If many David John, right? David John is the executive. Anybody director. who knows him, there, there you go. He runs that, and he is doing a lot of work. And you hear him now on TV because everyone's speaking about you know black men being killed. Right? Say her name. Say their name. Is the LGBTQ right? So David John does a lot of this research and work. So I'll get that to you as well. Yeah, another name that I would want to call out is Series Research, um, Series Poli Policy Research run by Angela Irvine out of California. Angela Irvine, Series is spelled C-E-R-E-S, uh, and she does great work on um, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression data vis-a-vis uh, -vis the juvenile justice system. That's Karen, what I was I just, thinking of. Karen, I just want to um, respond to Shakita's question here about um, state budget cuts and and um, how that may keep kids out of residential care and increase incarceration. Um, I will say that I think that there's been a lot of discussion about that because of Family First Act of the Family First Act. Um, which does require states to look at, um, you know, whether there's an increase in children in foster care going into the youth justice system. I do think that overall budget cuts are an opportunity for us to show that when community-based organizations are supported at appropriate levels, that they are the best position to respond to young people and their families. There's been a lot about um, therapeutic foster care um, and a lot of discussions about Family First and JJDPA that highlights alternate ways to congregate care, whether it is um, you know, funded by the child welfare system or funded by the juvenile justice system. We should be focused and involved in those cross-sector groups to make sure that the definitions of candidacy are appropriate, that they do not widen the net, but that they do protect children in custody, that people are thinking about what it means to be at risk for trafficking and pregnant and uh, parenting teens. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that we can be working on together across sector to make sure that all of our kids are, are being stabilized at home and in communities. Marcy, thank you for mentioning that. I think one of the things that we we're hearing from states, you know, during this pandemic is that you know, due to the budget shortfalls, uh, Family First is, um, a lot of states are asking for delays in Family First because just haven't had the time to focus on getting there, reducing the numbers of primary care. Of course, the QRT is the biggest piece that is the problem. Um, we are working with Ways and Meaning Finance to, to discuss some solutions around the services piece because we feel like that piece could still move forward, but we don't know how you know, Congress has an appetite for doing anything else with Family First because they've done so much this year, last year. Um, but I think that the, com the conversation is really about the immediate needs now with, you know, states' budgets like California. I think they are in a hundred million dollar decrease in their budget um, when I see a shortfall. And so um, just figuring out like some solutions for what nonprofits and providers could do now because they're being hit because a lot of them 
weren't eligible for some of the PPP funding um, because they're organizations that are over 500. So it's a lot of moving pieces, but this was a this was a question that was proposed just today from the Mental Health Advisory Board um, that I just thought that you guys might have heard from others about. But we can talk offline, of course. Terrific. Um, we still have time for a couple more questions. I, again, I, I've done something wrong with my chat box, so I can't read the questions, but my fellow panelists are doing a great job reading and fielding. Well, uh, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to give everybody a, a chance to just give a closing statement and then we will <laughs> I'm sorry, there, there is one. Um, from oh, Ann, go ahead. Okay, from Ann Williams. Curious about children who may end up in a juvenile facility and have been diagnosed with a learning disability. So I'm not sure, like curious to know about them. According to the law, this, the facility is supposed to continue the services that that youth needs, whether it be PT, OT, speech therapy, whatever they're, they're getting. Um, I will leave it to Josh and Marcy and them who talk about the state level um, and what that's done, but it's under IDEA, Individuals with Disability Education Act, as well as the Americans with Disabilities Act. They're supposed to provide those services for that disabled youth. Marcy, you want to talk about what happens in the states? Yeah, I can quickly, um, Annie, I can send you the report. Um, Neelam Arya wrote a great report uh, on actually getting kids one really good way to get kids out of adult facilities is to use the protections in um, ADA and IDEA um, to, <laughs> to threaten to sue them because their education is so woefully inadequate. Um, so there's some good litigation on this that's going on. DC won a major case last year through the School Justice Project. The Juvenile Law Center has some good resources that I put into the chat there. Um, and, and, and JJDPA is actually requiring states to uh, tightening up their requirements around state ensuring that states are actually taking care of this but it is definitely something under COVID we know that education is not happening we know that every single state is violating IDEA um, probably in the in the school community overall um, but particularly in facilities so there are again there's opportunities I think also now but um, I can I can follow up with an email with you for additional resources that I didn't put in the chat. And, and let me jump in real quickly. In New York, there was a few lawsuits, you know, with juvenile justice and some of the facilities here in New York State. Um, so I think parents need to be more vigilant. The caretakers need to be more vigilant and advocate for your child. And don't go by yourself. When you're advocating, you know, go go with a team um, and take in all the policies and the regulations and the laws and understand. So they understand what your rights are. Thank you so much. Um, maybe we can just have everybody do a real quick closing statement and again uh, state and put your uh, email address and, and website into the chat box for folks because there's so much that was discussed here and so many good resources just so everybody has that again. Um, let's go from, from the end to the beginning and start with Dara. If you have anything you want to say in closing, Dara. Uh, no, you know, I just want to say thank you again to Karen and all of your great work out there. You are amazing. And I am so glad to be working with someone like you. Um, thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, and just keep up the good work out there. Uh, the fight is not over. Uh, uh, and also just be careful. Like I said, this pandemic is not over. Um, and we do have an opportunity to change. When people say, I want to go back to the new norm, like the old norm, we don't want that. We want a new system. We, you know, it is time for a new system. And I want people to keep forward that systemic racism is alive and well. And that's what we meant. We did not want to move the pieces on the chessboard. We wanted to take the pieces off, turn the chessboard over, and start a new game. And I want all of us to do that. And I thank you for everything you do each and every day. Thank you so much, Dara. Uh, we're, we're going in the backwards direction. Which, Josh, would you be next? Yeah, um, so thanks so much for having me. You know, I, I think one of the things that, that I think much of the country's been alerted to is the power of your local officials to make a difference. I think there, there's a tendency in progressive movements to turn to Washington for solutions. And, and there is so much to be done in Congress. 
But I think we've seen over the last month the power of your police chiefs, the power of your school boards, the power of your sheriff, the power of your district attorney. Um, you need to meet with these people. You need to talk with them and talk about your priorities and make sure that good people are in those offices and make sure that you hold them to account even after they get elected. By all means, get involved at every layer of elected office. But, you know, not many people go and meet with the sheriff and not many people go and meet with the district attorney. But these are people who have real power over who gets incarcerated and what happens in those facilities. So please um, get involved locally as well. Um, there's great organizations located in so many states. And, you know, if you're not sure where to start, you have our email addresses and we can try to connect you with someone in your state. Um, they are eager to have more people showing up at the state capitol lobbying on their priorities and, and influencing them to know what is important to you as a constituent too. So thanks, and, and just please continue to be in touch. That's so helpful. Thank you so much, Josh. Jeanette. I want to thank you, first of all, Karen, for inviting me. Marcy, thank you for all the work you've been doing. Dara, I need you in my life. <laughs> Josh, keep, keep, keep showing that data. Keep telling the stories. Um, I, I'm really honored and proud of the, of the work um, that happened and the work that's to happen. Again, let's celebrate our young people for being persistent and consistent with, with not allowing a, a, more abuse. They're tired of their dads being beat up, their grandfathers being beat up, their brothers being beat up, their mothers being abused, their sisters. Enough is enough. And this is the generation that really has become historical. Um, you know, we lost so many generations throughout the years. Uh, young people have been falling into these cracks of, and families of horrible systems. But I can honestly say that I am proud of our young people today. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Uh, and Marcy. Um, I'm going to echo everyone's thanks to Karen for your vision to put this panel together um, with my three of my favorite co-panelists. Co so thank you guys. I do want to point out Judge Lucero said, please meet with your juvenile court judges. Having worked with her over the years, I know she listens. She gets out to the community. Um, and you can change the conversation. Judges have a lot of power too. And you can change the conversations if they're able to get off the bench and into the community. So I echo that. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say is follow our children, right? They will not lead us astray. Um, they are, they have been at the forefront of every single revolution in this country. We are hearing them speak from their truths. Children do not lie. Um, and I just say, follow them and we will be um, heading in the right direction. So I love that. Care. Thank Everybody. you so much. I'm so thrilled and honored that you incredible four people came onto this panel with me. I hope that everybody who was listening got a lot of information. And like Jeanette said, we need all of you in our lives and everybody on this panel, we all need you in our lives. And luckily they opened up their, their lives and hearts to us and information by giving us their contact information in the chat. So please do follow up with them and make a difference. The big thing take away from this is we're the ones that change things the supreme court didn't do those decisions on their own they were forced to by people in the streets that's the only way it happens and there's lots of way to engage it's still a democracy and power to the people thank you everybody thank Dara, i'm gonna you, stay don't on hang up. Yeah, I said, don't hang up karen i'm gonna stay on with you okay but everybody else can hang up <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Marcy, that was wonderful. Good work. It's uh, Judge Gonzalez. I didn't have my camera working today. Sorry, Marcy. I said.